everyone and welcome back. Today we're going to be exploring an application of systems of nonlinear differential equations, in particular directed to ecological models, sometimes referred to as predator-prey models. So we're going to keep things a little bit basic here, uh, but once you do understand the basic mechanisms of predator-prey models, you can easily vary them and adapt them to whatever structures and constraints that you want your system to obey. So we're going to be starting with a basic predator-prey model with one predator and one prey. For the sake of descriptions and conversations, let's define our prey to be, say, rabbits. And let's define our prey or predator to be foxes. This is the classical predator-prey model, so rabbits versus foxes. So we're going to be working under a couple basic assumptions here. We're going to be assuming that the exponential growth of our prey, in this case rabbits, um, follows that constant pattern. So if I were to independently model the growth of our rabbits, then the differential equation that models exponential growth will be equal to alpha x, where alpha is going to be some non-negative constant. Now, in terms of natural death and emigration of predator, and if you don't know what emigration is, that's where your foxes leave the system because they don't have any food to eat and they just migrate elsewhere. And natural death, for example, the rabbits could be poisoned or um, diseased or something along those lines. All right, so the natural death and emigration of our foxes should also obey some model. And let's assume for the sake of simplicity that that also follows some exponential growth, but not too or or not too strong of an exponential decay. Uh, and let's assume that that model is y prime of t is equal to minus beta of y. Here we're going to assume that beta is equal to zero. With that negative coefficient, this is going to be an exponential decay model. And the last basic mechanism that we want our system to obey is that the predator is going to be attacking our prey proportional to the prey's population. So the more rabbits there are, the more rabbits the foxes will uh, attack or eat or whatever. So if that is the case, then what exactly do we mean? So that means a it hurts rabbits, hurts rabbits, and it has to benefit the fox, foxes. So if we combine these three mechanisms together into a system of differential equations, what are we going to have? So we're going to have x prime of t is equal to alpha x, that's our exponential growth for our rabbits, and then we're going to have y prime of t is equal to minus beta y for our exponential k for foxes. And then we're going to have an interaction term between rabbits and foxes, and it's going to have a negative impact for rabbits, and it's going to have a positive impact for foxes, and let's assume that we can vary that constant with some proportionality constant, let's call gamma. Right? So gamma here is going to be a positive constant as well. Right? So this system that I have obviously is a nonlinear system because it does have that interaction coefficient gamma, which is defined to be positive, so it's non-zero. Um, so, you know, that begins uh, our journey. So this particular very famous and simple system is sometimes referred to as the Lodka, Lodka Volterra equation or system. So the Lodka Volterra predator prey system, or some people just call it the predator prey system. So the first question, once we have this system, is how to solve. So how to solve this nonlinear system of differential equations. So um, the first thing that I want to do is I want to rewrite x prime of t and y prime of t in terms of their differentials. In particular, dx dt is equal to alpha x minus gamma xy, and dy over dt is going to be equal to minus beta y plus gamma xy. And one very important thing that I want you to notice is that this is indeed an autonomous uh, system of differential equations, right? So you do not see t explicitly mentioned here. So generally speaking, these are just parametric equations. Maybe I can get rid of that dt uh, that's in the bottom of both of those systems and make it just an uh, equation in terms of x and y. And as long as there's no differentials of x and y, then that would be our implicit solution um, to our Lodico Volterra system. So if I solve these equations for dt, what is that going to give us? So dt in our first equation is going to be equal to dx 
over alpha x minus gamma xy. And dt in the second equation is going to be equal to dy all over minus beta y plus gamma xy. And then, since both of them are equal to dd, I'm going to set them equal to each other and see if we can solve for x and y. So the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to factor out an x out of the denominator there. So I'm going to have dx all over x times alpha minus gamma y. And on the right hand side, I'm going to have dy divided by y times minus beta plus gamma x. Right. So then I'm going to isolate my y terms and our x terms because notice that our, our y terms are in that bracket, our x terms are in that bracket. So this is indeed a separable differential equation, which is very nice. So once I rearrange this, I'm going to have what? So it's going to be left with... Uh, let's call it gamma x minus beta all over x dx is equal to alpha minus gamma y all over y dy. Right, so now it's time to integrate this, but I want to decompose these fractions to make it a little bit more easier to see. So it's going to be equal to the integral of gamma minus beta over x dx is equal to the integral of alpha over y minus gamma dy. So now it's time to integrate. So that's going to give us gamma x minus beta natural log of x is equal to alpha natural log of y minus gamma y plus some arbitrary constant c combined from the smaller arbitrary constants from both of our integrals. So this is our implicit solution to our system of differential equations. Now, obviously I can solve this equation for C to make it a little bit more nicer to look at. Um, so I can, for example, move our gamma to the left-hand side. That's going to give us gamma times x plus y. And then I can move my alpha natural log of y to the left-hand side as well. And then that's going to give us beta natural log of x minus alpha natural log of y. And that's going to be equal to our arbitrary constant C there. Right? So that is our implicit solution. And keep in mind, let's define a domain for this. In particular, x and y should both be non-negative. Now, if x and or y are equal to zero, for example, if x is identically equal to zero, that means our rabbits are extinct. And if y is identically equal to zero, that means our foxes are extinct. And if both x and y are both identically equal to zero, and rabbits and foxes are the only uh, species within this ecological system, that means there are no longer any animals whatsoever inside of our system. So now that we have this implicit function or curve um, for all x, y positive um, that make this lock of Altera system true, now let's see if we can understand the uh, time-dependent dynamics of this system. So what does this family of curves look like? So the first thing that I want to find are the critical points for this nonlinear system. So what is that going to be? So keep in mind x prime will be equal to alpha x minus gamma xy and y prime will be equal to minus beta y plus gamma xy. That's our logic of Rotera system. So our critical points are where x prime and y prime are both equal to zero simultaneously. So that's going to give us, uh, let's see, let's factor out an x there and a y there. That's going to give us x times alpha minus gamma y is equal to zero. And y minus beta plus gamma x, that's going to be equal to zero. So it's clearly C, it's clearly easy to see um, that x, y equals zero, zero is a critical point, right? But this is not a very happy critical point because when x and y are both equal to zero, uh, that would imply that both species are extinct, right? So that's quite sad. So that's definitely not the critical point that we want to analyze here, but it definitely can exist theoretically. So when are the other critical points uh, in existence. Obviously, we can do x equals to zero with that. We could do y is equal to zero in that. 
but keep in mind if x and or y is equal to zero, one or both of the species are extinct, so those are a little bit more uh, sadder situations. So what we want to do is we want to analyze where both are non-extinct, or the non-extinct critical points. Right. So when does that occur at one or possibly more places? So that occurs when alpha minus gamma y is equal to zero, and minus beta plus gamma x is equal to zero. So what we have is an uh, uncoupled um, algebraic system of equations, so we can solve for y and x respectively. So x is going to be equal to what? That's going to be equal to beta divided by gamma, and y is going to be equal to alpha divided by gamma. So that means what? That means beta over gamma, alpha over gamma, is a critical point that does not hopefully generate extinct species. Right? So what type of critical point is this particular critical point? And one can also ask, well, what about zero, zero? What type of critical point um, is that? So that means since we're in the nonlinear world, we need to consider the Jacobian and consider the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of that Jacobian at each of those critical points. So x prime, again, is alpha x minus gamma xy, and y prime is equal to minus beta y plus gamma xy. So the Jacobian of this, keep in mind, is going to start off with the partial derivative of the first relation with respect to x, which is going to be equal to alpha minus gamma y, and then the partial derivative of the first relation with respect to y, so that's just going to be focusing on that last term, which is going to be minus gamma x. And then the partial derivative of the second relation with respect to x, so that's just going to be focusing on that last term, so it's just going to be equal to gamma y. And the partial derivative of the last relation with respect to y, and that's just going to give us gamma x minus beta. So that is the Jacobian for the entire ecological logic of our Terra system. So if we analyze the Jacobian at the both species extinct point, 0, 0, that's just going to give us alpha, 0, and then 0, minus beta. Right? So it's since we're in a diagonal matrix, the eigenvalues are pretty obvious. Lambda 1 is equal to alpha, and lambda 2 is equal to minus beta. And we're assuming that since alpha and beta are both positive, by definition, we have that these two both belong in the set of real numbers, and they are opposite signs. So since they are opposite signs, that implies that 0, 0 is a saddle point. Agreed? So that gives us that particular thing, and in particular, the positive eigenvalue is lambda 1, which is associated to x, because minus beta is associated to y. So the dominant eigenvector, which in this case is going to be 1, 0, and the subdominant eigenvector, which is going to be 0, 1, as t goes to infinity, it's going to be dominated by 1, 0. So if we look at the phase portrait around 0, 0, which is going to be assumed to be there, our phase portrait is going to be going towards 1, 0, which is going to be this particular diagram. Now keep in mind, there are a couple other things in this phase diagram if we were to extend the boundaries because, for example, we could go there, we could go there, or we could go there. But keep in mind, these regions over here do not really make any sense because that means our species uh, have negative population or potentially zero population if we are analyzing uh, on these axes, right? So let's assume that those are not part of the conversation. So that first quadrant, where we have all these flow lines, that's going to be the phase portrait once we get around zero. Right? So that's pretty nice. Now, what happens around the other critical point? That's the more interesting one. So what is the Jacobian around beta gamma alpha gamma? So that's going to be equal to what? So if we plug that into our Jacobian, we're going to have alpha minus gamma times alpha over gamma. Then we're going to have minus gamma times beta over gamma. Then we're going to have gamma times alpha over gamma. And then over here we're going to have gamma beta over gamma minus beta. And a lot of things actually reduce quite nicely here. And we're just going to be left with 0 minus beta alpha and 0. 
So that's the Jacobian around our non-extinctual critical point. So let's see if we can find the eigenvalues of that matrix. So the eigenvalues are going to be generated from the system minus lambda minus beta alpha minus lambda times xy is equal to 0, 0. So if we try and solve this particular uh, equation, um, what are we going to have? So the characteristic polynomial, so let's not go for eigenvectors quite yet. So we need to find the determinant of this. That's going to give us lambda squared plus alpha beta. Right? So keep in mind, alpha and beta are both positive. So that means once we rearrange this, that's going to give us, once we set it equal to zero, lambda squared is going to be equal to minus alpha beta. So that is a negative real number. So that means when I take the square root of it, lambda is going to be equal to plus or minus the square root of alpha beta, alpha beta both a positive number, times i. So what do we have here? So we have complex eigenvalues with real part equal to zero, and obviously they are opposite imaginary part signs. So therefore, this point, our critical point, beta over gamma, alpha over gamma is a center, right? So, i.e. it's a series of closed paths. And in particular, they are rotating counterclockwise because of the relationships with the zero, zero critical point that we've already analyzed before. So if we were to sketch the phase portraits, of our lat couple terra system, this is what we're going to have. So we're going to be revolving in that direction and in that direction there. Right? So that's one region. One can find that that's going to be another region. One can find that this is going to be another region. And one can find that this is another region. And they're all going to be circling around our critical point, which is located right here. And we already know what that x value is. That x value is beta over gamma. And then we have alpha over gamma. And this point sometimes is, has a famous name. It's a point of population equilibria, right? So if you can reach that particular um, population, for example, with an initial condition, that means the populations will stay non-extinct, non-increasing, non-decreasing for all of eternity, right? But if I were to choose any other initial condition in this particular s system where they are non-extinct, for example, this one, what's going to happen? Well, the populations of rabbits is going to increase, and then all of a sudden the population of foxes is going to decrease and then the population of foxes is going to continue to increase but rabbits will now decrease and converge to zero but when it goes to zero then the foxes need to leave because they don't have any food and then the population of foxes will then go down and then the populations of rabbits will then increase and then it continues in that spiral fashion around that point of equilibrium. Now that we know the general structure of the lot couple terra predator prey model, let's consider a couple little variations that you can actually implement quite easily in the one predator, one prey model. So the current model that I've already discussed is what is referred to as a conservative system. And when I say a conservative system, I mean the following. If one species benefits, the other species suffers. If one species benefits, the other species suffers. So in some sense, one could say that there is no inter-species interaction, good or bad. All right? That is, foxes aren't helping foxes, rabbits aren't helping rabbits. Because if the rabbits are helping rabbits, then the rabbits would have to hurt rabbits equivalently, right? So in some sense, those have to balance out. 
to give us a zero, zero correlation. So generally speaking, if x is one of your species, then one can find that the general relation for that Lattica-Federa system is going to be equal to x times alpha 1 plus gamma 1, 1, x plus gamma 1, 2, y. And then y prime is going to be equal to y times alpha 2 plus gamma 2, 1, x plus gamma 2, 2, y. Right, so this is going to be your general structure for a one predator prey two predator prey, depending on the pairings that you have here, right? But keep in mind, if one species benefits, the other species suffers, that implies that these interactions between x and y, because notice that this coefficient gamma 1, 1 is the interaction with x with x, x, y, that's the interaction uh, with species 1 with species 2, and then here, this is the interaction of species 2 with species 1, which should be opposites if it is in a conservative manner, right? Because these two numbers should be the opposites as they were in the previous example. And then lastly, we have uh, y interacting with y. Um, in a conservative system, this would happen to be equal to zero. So in terms of sort of simplifying the representation, what we usually do is define what is called the interaction matrix. The interaction matrix, which has all these coefficients gamma ij. So the interaction matrix in this case, generally speaking, is gamma 1, 1, gamma 1, 2, gamma 2, 1, and gamma 2, 2, right? And as already specified before, if the system is conservative, then 1, gamma 1, 1, and gamma 2, 2 are both equal to 0, and gamma 1, 2, and gamma 2, 1 have to be opposites, regardless of the order. All right now, in the last example I did, assume that they um, have equal magnitude, but generally speaking, they do not. For example, one uh, species might suffer a little, um, whereas the other species might benefit a lot, right? So it's not necessarily of equal magnitudes, but as long as they're opposite signs, then that is a conservative system. So an example of a interaction matrix for a conservative system would be, for example, 0, minus 5, 5, and 0. So notice that if my minus 5 is on the first row, that means this is my prey, and that must be my predator. And if I were to construct another interaction matrix, if I do 0, 3, minus 2, 0, now row 1 corresponds to my predator and minus two corresponds to my prey. And since these are opposite signs and my diagonals are both equal to zero, that means these are interaction matrices for conservative systems. But there are several other uh, different types of uh, scenarios that you could encounter. For example, um, could there be three species? For example, a three plus species system. Indeed, you could have three species. For example, let's just draw a little diagram. Let's assume we have snake. Let's assume we have bird. And let's assume we have shark, right? So let's assume that snake eats bird. Bird, if it's big enough, eats shark. And shark eats snake. So let's assume that this is uh, x1, x2, and x3. So we have a three species ecological system. Let's assume that the uh, interaction between snake and bird um, is say gamma five with equal uh, interaction in the other direction of minus five. Uh, let's assume for bird, it's gamma is equal to seven and gamma is equal to minus seven, so equal interactions. And then gamma is equal to four and gamma is equal to minus four for our, shake, our, our shark and snake interaction. Right. So in this particular case, this is going to be a conservative system. For example, snake eats bird, so snake benefits, bird uh, does not benefit, it suffers. Bird benefits from shark, but shark suffers from bird. Uh, and snake suffers from shark, but shark uh, benefits from snake. So if that is the case, what is going to be our interaction matrix? So our interaction matrix in terms of x1, x2, x3, let's sort of draw it like this. 
is going to be equal to what? So since it's, you know, snake's not helping snake, bird's not helping bird, and shark's not helping shark, our diagonal entries are going to be equal to zero. Right? That much is clear. And then what's going to happen? So keep in mind this cell corresponds to the interaction between x1 and x2, right? So that's going to be snake versus bird. So x1, snake, benefits from bird. Therefore, this is going to be a positive coefficient. And that means minus 5 must be in the 2, 1 position uh, with the opposite sign. Now, what happens between uh, snake, which is still x1, and x3, which is shark, right? Well, snake suffers from shark at a rate of four. That means this must be equal to four and that must be equal to positive four. And then over here, what do we have? So that's the interaction between two with three, right? So bird with shark. So does bird help shark or does bird, um, you know, get hurt by shark in this particular case, right? So x2 benefits from shark because bird eats shark under the assumptions. Um, under the interaction, uh, gamma is equal to, what is this? Five, four, and seven. So that should be equal to seven and that should be equal to minus seven. So that would be your interaction matrix between uh, snake, bird, and shark. Uh, assuming that snake hurts bird, bird hurts shark, uh, shark hurts snake, and everything else uh, is remained, you know, in equilibrium or in a conservative fashion, right? So that's practically what you can have if you have a three plus species system. Now, what if it's not uh, conservative? So another type of ecological system is what we refer to as cooperative. Cooperative. So a cooperative ecological system is where every species every species benefits from one another, including themselves, including themselves, right? So let's uh, lay down a couple uh, animals. So let's do toothpick bird and let's do crocodile. So crocodiles help themselves and toothpick birds help themselves, right? So let's assume that a toothpick bird helps crocodile with interaction of seven. Um, and let's also assume that it goes the other way around in also a positive fashion. Let's assume gamma is equal to seven as well. Let's assume crocodile uh, helps crocodile at an interaction rate of nine and toothpick bird helps out toothpick bird with an interaction rate of 10. So in this particular cooperative system, our interaction matrix is going to be equal to 10, 7, 7, and 9, right? And then you can use whatever method you have in order to solve your lack of star system with this particular interaction matrix and model what happens as x and y, as t goes to infinity, what happens to x and y. You probably can guess that both are going to go to infinity and indeed you would be correct. Now, a third ecological system is what is referred to as a competitive system, right? A competitive system. So this is where every species, every species competes against one another, including themselves. including themselves. So this is more of a darker story. So let's assume that we have two species. Let's do humans and let's do sharks. Unfortunately, there are humans who want to hurt others and there are sharks who want to hurt themselves as well. So let's assume the humans um, attack sharks at an interaction rate of say minus eight. And let's assume that uh, sharks hurt humans at an interaction rate of say uh, minus, uh, maybe minus four. And let's assume that sharks hurt themselves at a rate of minus three and humans hurt themselves at a rate of, let's say minus 10. So what would be the interaction matrix for this particular system? So in this case, what do we have? So let's assume that humans is X1 and sharks are X2. So what we have here is minus 10 and minus three for our self interactions. Humans hurt sharks or get hurt by sharks at minus eight. 
and then minus four uh, for this particular thing. And obviously these could swap depending on the interpretations of this diagram. So make sure you understand um, what this flow diagram actually represents. And then most fun of them all is your free for all where any rule goes. Any rule goes and those rules can change. Those rules can change at any time t. So for example, humans can help humans, sharks can help sharks, and they can go against each other. Um, humans can hurt sharks, sharks can hurt sharks, which is is likely going to lead to an extinction of sharks in the long term. Um, and keep in mind, you can have three or 50 or 100 million different species in the system where practically all the rules are just a, a mixture of these three primarily rules of competitive, conservative, um, and uh, competitive uh, system rules, right? But that's practically the main things that you definitely should know uh, when it comes to predator-prey ecological systems. And keep in mind, if you cannot find the exact uh, solution or the exact implicit solution, you can always use, for example, Euler's or Ringo Kutu methods in order to obtain the approximate solution. Just make sure that your delta T is really small so your solution is as close to accurate as possible. So those are the main things you definitely should know when it comes to predator-prey models. Hope you enjoyed this video, and I'll see you in the next one. Take care.